My name is Jeffrey Cannon, and you're listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled Rethinking Oil and Gas Construction Using Digital. Digital innovation applied to construction could make the biggest impact on the economics of Canada's birthing LNG industry, and here's how. Recently, I had the pleasure of hosting a couple of my Japanese colleagues in Calgary who are visiting with a number of organizations to share how Japanese gas buyers view the LNG sector. This interested me because Canada totally missed the last window for launching any LNG projects, but the good news is that the window looks like it's unexpectedly opening again. What Japan thinks is important because they're the biggest buyer, some 80 million tons per year, and they therefore set the market tempo. But bluntly, Japanese gas buyers are not confident in Canada's ability to cost-effectively build new LNG export infrastructure. They benchmarked LNG cost structures across all of the planned export terminals, from Russia, Qatar, East Africa, Australia, Canada, and the U.S., and concluded that Canadian ambitions are still at the edge of the acceptable cost profile. In broad strokes, here's what they believe reflects Canada's reality, and and these costs are all measured in dollars per million British thermal units, which is a measure of gas heat value. First is the gas cost. Two dollars for BC gas. This is effectively the Alberta Eco gas hub price. The price varies a bit and has even gone negative recently, but not that we want to give our gas away. Next is transportation. One dollar to get BC gas to the coast over a new pipeline. This is the 20-year toll to play for the capital and operating cost of the pipe. Third, manufacturing. Three to four dollars to liquefy gas, a similar cost to the U.S. Gulf Coast toll, and good for 20 years. And also includes power costs. And finally, shipping. $1 $1 to $2 to ship LNG to Tokyo. This, of course, is set by the market for shipping in Canada. Can't really impact this number. This yields, therefore, a total cost of between $7 to $9 for a two-train, 16 million ton per year facility. I could, of course, point out the dual Canadian advantages. The shipping cost from Canada, as compared to U.S. or Australia, is less. We are permanently closer to the markets. Thank you, geology and geography. And we don't have canal tolls. And Canada's gas is lower cost, largely because the U.S. has so much now that Canadian gas trades at a discount to U.S. gas. We also need to beat the American advantages. The U.S. plants already have pipeline access, therefore they don't have to bother building that uh, long pipeline and therefore avoid the shipping costs. And they can repurpose existing regas plants to save a bit of capital. The Australian LNG projects are now similar to the U.S., Adding additional facilities to an existing plant has a much lower cost because so much of the capital is reusable. Jetties, tankage, laydown yards, work camps, utilities, and offsites, not to mention a trained workforce. Therefore, our big opportunity is in that controllable $3 to $4 cost to liquefy the gas. Can we do better? And if so, how? One of my final projects before I moved from Australia in late 2016 was to benchmark the Australian LNG projects for competitiveness and to provide guidance on what Australia needed to do to improve its position. We concluded that an LNG project could cut its liquefaction cost by $1 per MMBTU per year for a full 20 years by shortening the four-year construction project to three years. To put that in perspective, 1 million metric tons of LNG is 52 trillion British thermal units. So a 16 million ton plant delivered 12 months faster creates a pricing advantage worth $830 million per year for 20 years. That is a lot of money. So, how could digital innovation shrink the construction cycle time? Now, the oil and gas industry has refined a number of tactical ways to manage the timelines for the construction of its facilities, starting with the Qatari developments in the 1990s, fine-tuned in Australia, and now coming to North America. The engineering world, of course, is now highly digital, with designs completed almost entirely on digital tools. Instead of building the LNG facilities on site, they're built as a series of modules in overseas uh, fabrication yards and are floated to the site where they're lifted into place and welded together. Multiple yards can build multiple modules in parallel, saving time. Certain items with long lead times like steel are ordered early. That avoids some delays. Some expensive rental equipment, such as cranes and ships that are in high demand, get booked for specific times. That avoids paying spot prices for them. Owners try to put in place union agreements that will last throughout project duration and negotiate fixed-price work packages with contractors. This, of course, pushes cost and schedule risk to those contractors, but can also motivate contractors to remove from their bids anything that adds cost, like innovation. My conclusion is that these tactics are solid contracting strategies, but digital innovation isn't getting any airtime. 
To test my hypothesis, I met with two engineering procurement and construction firms to ask about how they would react to any digital innovation imposed by the owners. Their answer? We raise our prices by at least 20%. The reason is that the EPC industry has already invested in its own systems and methods for its purposes, which they are loath to strand. While incumbent EPC firms are in a strong position to push digital innovation onto the construction sector, they don't. And as a result, $1 trillion of oil and gas infrastructure projects are stranded on the books. Not surprisingly, the construction sector is frequently called out as being the least digitally enabled industry in the world. Construction productivity globally has actually declined by 20% over the past two decades, whereas most other industries have become more productive. Even the Canadian federal government doesn't put much hope in the industry improving its performance. In the recent supercluster funding program, the construction industry lost out to fishing and farming. All the tools that could enable the construction industry to improve its productivity are available today, though, and all are based on the same building blocks for all of the other industries. Things like cloud computing, mobile devices, analytics, cheap sensors, and robots. Here's just a sample of how they could be configured to extract time out of the construction schedule. Number one, digitize the design. A cloud version of the plant design, not just the workings of the methane chiller, but the whole plant, is an immensely important asset. It serves as the basis for quality and technical reviews, workforce mobilization, and stakeholder engagement. Reviews that surface design problems can eliminate rework. Orienting and mobilizing the workforce faster cuts down on delays. Showing stakeholders what the plant will actually do removes resistance to the project, and a digital design can be fed into an augmented reality engine to give users a far more visceral experience engaging with the design. Next is to digitize the plan. A great design without a great plan will likely take longer to execute. Industry leaders convert the construction plan to a kind of computerized video, which they subject to the same kind of quality and technical reviews, mobilization, and stakeholder sessions as the plan design itself. As much as 10% of the construction time can be cut out of the plan once engineers can more easily visualize how the plan works in practice. There's no reason why the digital plan could not incorporate every worker, every rental asset, every tool, every permit, every movement. This kind of big data problem has been crushed in so many other industries. Next is to apply artificial intelligence to the plan and the design together. With the plan and the design now linked up digitally, artificial intelligence can be put to work to analyze the plan and the design to figure out better ways to build and execute. The plan could be tested and run millions of times under any variety of specific goals and scenarios to see its behavior and how it could be improved. Next is to build the digital version of the as-built. A big issue in construction is that subtle design and build interface errors are caught far too late. An interface is where one fabricated asset has to line up with another asset. Industry leaders fly drones over the modules and fab yards and the corresponding interface at site to find those interface errors quickly. In this way, actual delivered assets match each other once they are mated and delays are eliminated. Next is to inspect and supervise using digital. Another issue in construction is that the scale of works can outstrip human capacity to understand and manage. Industry leaders are now using drones to fly over large construction sites to gather detailed data from the air and build a digital version of work in progress that is used to inform the state of the build. Better data about current progress is vital to making better choices to keep a project to schedule. Next is to speed up movements and approvals. A big cause of construction delays involves the paperwork required to move physical things across various jurisdictions. Customs forms, inspections, manifests, packing lists, container notifications, etc. This is a perfect use case for blockchain, which can remove delays in moving items through a supply chain by making data common and shared. Next is to know where things are. Construction sites can be a bit chaotic, and finding necessary things that have gone walkabout is a constant problem. Not so in a digital world. Inexpensive sensors can be affixed to tools, equipment, assets, and vehicles to give real-time visibility. It should now be unacceptable that we can't see where construction equipment is on a site while we can see an Uber cab making its way to a pickup point. And last but not least is to coordinate the crews. Studies repeatedly show that field worker productivity in oil and gas is at best 50% because of late starts, early quits, missing permits, missing tools, wrong crew skills, and so on. However, virtually every worker on a construction site now has a supercomputer in their pocket. These should be far better utilized to provide training, capture safety concerns, send and receive work instructions, issue permits, track tool usage, record hours, 
capture productivity data, and identify quality problems. Even the simple act of getting onto a site could be accelerated by using an app and a reader at the gate to let workers swipe in quickly. So my conclusion is that Canada's LNG projects could beat the Australians and the Americans at their own game by accelerating capital project delivery via digital innovation. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.